Bonjour à tout le monde. Welcome to Bordeaux. Just, as you can see, it's a fantastic place to be, a fantastic venue. And to tell us a little bit more about it, let me introduce Antoine Bouet, who's our host here in Bordeaux, who has uh, an affiliation with the Bordeaux School of Economics, but he has many affiliations. And he was appointed uh, recently to be director of the CIPI, which is a well-renowned uh, economic research agency, uh, part of the French government. Um, so very prestigious position and very prestigious institute. So Antoine, why don't you uh, say a few words of yeah. welcome? So um, I will not be very long. Uh, I just want to tell you uh, bienvenue, uh, welcome. Uh, I know that uh, uh, the last three conferences were were um, distant, and so there was a uh, frustrations about uh, socialization. So I hope that uh, you will have time to socialize. Uh, Bordeaux is the right place to do that. Uh, I insist on the fact that, uh, in the name of all the my colleagues from Bordeaux School of Economics, we are very pleased to uh, welcome you and to host this conference. Um, the logistic details are in the document, so you have Wi-Fi, you have the WOVA application. Uh, the architecture of this building is a little bit complicated and, and the staircase are not exactly uh, convergent, I would say, so <laughs> do not hesitate to ask our staff some help if you want some, some directions. There are uh, uh, the, the plenary sessions and I think the award ceremony uh, this evening will take place in the Amphidugi here. Uh, all the br uh, coffee breaks and the lunch will take place in the main halls and in, in the two rooms on each side of the uh, main hall. Uh, there are six uh, rooms for parallel sessions. Uh, there are three floors. Uh, the main rooms for parallel sessions are at the first floor. The first floor is a little bit, you know, just exactly at the level of this one. So it's a little bit complicated, but there are some panels to indicate the, all the directions. Bienvenue, welcome, enjoy your stay in Bordeaux. Thank you. So before we get to the first plenary talk, um, first of all, let me introduce Atmar Edenhofer, who's uh, uh, co-chair co of uh, the Potsdam Institute for Climate Impact, otherwise known to us as PIC, P-I-K. Um, Atmar, I think, is a jinx, because uh, unfortunately he couldn't be here physically. He's stuck in Brussels after uh, travel issues. Uh, many of you probably remember that we had invited him to speak in Warsaw as well, and uh, he wasn't able to make it there either. So, But we're very happy to have him. Uh, Sergei Paltsev will be chairing uh, the plenary and will be introducing Atmar more formally uh, when we get to that point. Um, I like to take advantage of uh, having the floor to talk a little bit about the center and uh, about the uh, the board meeting. Most of you know that um, that GTAB is governed by an advisory board. Uh, I think currently we have 31 consortium members. Mem many of the board members are here in, in the audience. Uh, and we have a two-day discussion uh, about <coughs> center operations and, and, uh, and aspirations for, uh, for, for the center and its uh, working agenda. So I, I will uh, uh, walk through uh, some of the kind of highlights that we have over the last two two days. So, um, I can't stop it. I don't want to look backwards, but uh, so let me try. All right, so uh, I'll walk through the different components of our, of our program. So obviously uh, the, the most important uh, uh, for us and for you, of course, the database. Many of you are aware that we released um, GTAP 11 uh, re recently. I don't know what that's a typo that released for, because that's the, that, the official release, GTAP 11. We've added one reference here, so there are five in total right now. Um, 
We've made a major upgrade in the number of missing countries. So we've added 20 countries uh, uh, over the last two versions, many of them in Africa, where we had a, a lot of gaps. Uh, we've been working very closely with uh, partners, uh, particularly the UNECA represented here, um, but also with the World Bank and IFPRI. So we're, we're very happy about that. Um, and of course, there are many updated uh, input output tables as well as part of the new uh, database. Um, some of you are very astute and have seen issues with the current release. So we're, we're back at home trying to uh, rectify some of those issues and we'll be sending out an update uh, in, uh, after the conference, uh, along with uh, most of the satellite. There are other parts of the database that, that we've worked on over the last few months. Um, we had uh, a small discrepancy in our accounting of uh, energy-based CO2 emissions compared to uh, the uh, international databases. So we, we've, uh, we've worked very hard on, on getting rid of most of those discrepancies. I think, uh, I think you'll be happy with the results. Um, you're not, the CO, well, the greenhouse gas emissions database now also includes process emissions, something we didn't have before. So that's coming from things like cement manufacturing. So that's part of the database and we've consolidated uh, the, um, the uh, emissions database with, with the air pollution databases. So all of that's just in a single file now. And we're also including um, land use based emissions so that we're, the, the, the data itself is accounting for the full set of emissions uh, globally. All right. We've done a lot of work on, um, on developing a nutrition database and they're currently working as well on food loss and waste. And that, that should be made available uh, before, before the next conference, certainly. Um, with other partners, we've been working on non-tariff uh, measure database. So that's been um, work done with uh, UNCTAD in Geneva and uh, with um, GRIPS in uh, Tokyo. Uh, I think uh, that database is currently publicly available. Is that correct? Okay. Yeah. It's a publicly available, yeah? Not yet. The board members have it. All right. So we'll, we'll make that publicly available uh, relatively soon. Uh, we're doing work on a biofuels uh, enabled database. And then we've just been given a, a fairly significant grant to upgrade the uh, livestock. Uh, part of the database. So again, that most of that will be forthcoming um, in the in the following year. And we started working on version twelve because uh, we never stop, right? So um, uh, we hope to have uh, a pre-release ready for the board uh, within the next twelve months. And uh, because of COVID, we've decided to have only a two-year jump. So we're going to skip over COVID years, probably. So we haven't decided yet on the next reference year, but I wouldn't be surprised if it was 2023 and just skip over completely uh, COVID. That's on the database. On the model, uh, a lot of our efforts have been on the recursive dynamic version uh, of GTAB. Um, and we're, we're converting that also into an integrated assessment model. So, on top of having the energy-based emissions, uh, we will also have uh, a simple climate module, an impact module, and eventually uh, an adaptation module as well. So that that is ongoing, and, and uh, we hope to um, have that available soon. We're also doing a, a fair amount of work on what we call GTAP SR, which stands for sub-regional. So. Um, we're integrating right now, there's a, a database um, out of the Wind DC consortium headed by Tom Rutherford, who I think is here in the crowd. Um, and so we're merging the, uh, the US states based uh, database into the GTAP database to be able to embed that into a global model with all the, all the states of the United States. All right, uh, we also have partners uh, doing the same type of data integration in Canada, China, and the UK. And there are uh, other countries, obviously, that could do this. Uh, you know, uh, Brazil would be 
would be would be one example, for example. So we do have right now a, a global CG model. It, it's GTAP-like, but but there are differences, not only due to uh, the subregions, but also because the functional characteristics of the database uh, don't line up exactly with what would be needed for, for a full GTAP model. Um, and that will be available in both Chempack and GAN. So we're very excited about this work. When you talk to policymakers, you know, a lot of it's about what's happening in my department, my province, my state. And we're hoping with this that we'll be able to answer uh, some of those questions. Um, on GTAB View, uh, last, the last year, everything was still online. We, we uh, still have very good attendance at uh, GTAB 101 the standard short course and the PTA course. This year, uh, we're hoping, well, we are moving towards uh, a hybrid format for the short course and the dynamic uh, short course. So th they will be, the first part will be online and then we'll have uh, physical courses at, at Purdue, uh, respectively in July and in October. Um, we're also updating all the courses uh, to be compliant with version seven of the GTAB model. We just finished uh, doing that for the uh, 101 course and we're working on doing the same for uh, the PTA and ATT courses. The other thing uh, we've done with help from our, our, our education provost, Zenep, who's also here in attendance, so if you have more questions about this, please feel free to talk to her. We now have a new portal where uh, anybody can propose a course. All right, so we're, we're kind of trying to crowdsource uh, extra courses in the GTAB uh, universe, and you'll be able to do that through, uh, through that portal. We're also working on modularizing the courses so that, um, for example, you know, almost every course has to have a module on database. Well, that, 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 that component will be uniform across all the courses. Um, so if you're gonna develop a course, you should be aware of what modules are already available and then structure your syllabus around the existing, uh, uh, existing module. Um, conferences, um, we've already committed to uh, being in Fort Collins next year. Uh, that will be uh, also an excellent venue. Um, it doesn't have the history of Bordeaux, but it has the mountains. And they're, they're very beautiful, and it has a lot of breweries as well. So instead of wine, we'll be drinking beer next year. Um, then uh, Kigali, which was supposed to have occurred last year, uh, will, will happen in uh, 2025. We're under discussion about what we'll do in 2026. I, as director of the center, I'm never too happy to have this uncertainty because we normally plan these things, you know, well in advance. Um, we actually had a, a board discussion yesterday about um, whether, on two things. One was the cost of the conference and whether it's getting too high. Uh, we'll go back and, and look at the books and see where, where we can cut back a little bit. But there's also concern about our carbon footprint. So um, th those are the, uh, the externalities, right? So we, we've had a discussion whether we wouldn't go to a biannual cycle for the physical meeting and, uh, and then doing it electronically uh, every other alternate year. So uh, we're going to go back, think about it, uh, have discussions with the board. We'd certainly love to hear from all of you about, about that idea. So during coffee breaks and whatnot, uh, please feel free to uh, tell us what you might be thinking about going to a, a biannual physical meeting rather than annual. Um, on outreach, um, the JTA is now in its eighth year. Um, it's, it's, um, we see a rising impact factor and it's rising uh, in the rankings of, of all uh, uh, economic journals. So we're very happy about that. Uh, we've linked the, the, um, the, um, the issues now to webinar series and we've had 
pretty good attendance uh, at that. So I would urge you um, to uh, to attend those webinars on on the uh, uh, on the articles as they come out. Uh, we're working a lot with with Tom and his group uh, with Glassnet. Um, if you want to find out more about Glassnet, talk to Tom or go. Uh, go to the website. Uh, over the last year, we started an early career program, um, which I, I think many of you uh, would be eligible for and should think about. Uh, and that also has a webinar series. Um, so um, again, go, go to that website and find out uh, more information on, on that. Now. Um, on the network, um, the current count is 27,000 plus in counting. Uh, whenever I give a talk on GTAB, I have to go to Ginger and get, get the latest numbers because they're always going up. Um, and this provides a, a little bit um, of an overview of, of where, where people are. All right, so. Um, At the board, we had a lot of other discussions. So we, 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 every, every year we try and introduce uh, some topical issues, uh, mostly coming from the board members themselves. So um, we had a talk uh, from the World Bank on uh, they're developing this so-called CBAM exposure index. So CBAM is carbon border adjustment measure. So Think about an next border in Africa, for example. This index is trying to measure um, how how a CBAM may be affecting uh, exports into Europe if Europe imposes a CBAM. Um, so that that is a very uh, interesting piece of work. Um, uh, the ClassNet team um, provided a. a um, uh, an overview, a summary of the work they've been doing on water scarcity using uh, the simple G global model. So that's a that's a, a gridded model. Um, I don't remember how many grid cells you had, over a million, I think. So very detailed um, uh, uh, model. We then had a, a, a discussion on decoupling, which is uh, very topical right now amongst policymakers. A lot of the agencies are doing uh, work on decoupling, so um, we, we kind of had a round table as to how people uh, view it. Um, if I uh, can summarize it very briefly, it sounds like there's not much evidence of decoupling in trade yet, uh, but there, there's evidence that in terms of investment there is, so that could impact uh, future trade relations uh, going ahead. Um, there was a very interesting paper on trade policy and labor mobility, taking off of work that uh, Maureen and Peter did in 2008, I think. Um, so this was uh, work uh, done by uh, Canada Trade. Um, so very, very interesting uh, uh, modeling of, of, um, of how labor moves across occupations and activities um, and link that to trade policy. Um, most of you probably know about the SSPs. These are the so-called shared socioeconomic pathways. These are the, um, the basic drivers for almost all work on, on climate change. Um, these are uh, pathways for population and GDP through 2100. They were developed in the early 2010s. Um, but a lot has happened over the last decade, including revisions to the original uh, uh, data. So um, uh, uh, the OECD is currently updating uh, these along with uh, the demographics is coming from IASA. Um, and um, we expect to see a public release probably in November. Uh, there'll be a session on, on this topic uh, during uh, during the conference, and uh, please, please come and attend. Um, and then there's been uh, a lot of new work on on trade elasticities. Um, we, we had thought they were converging towards a high level, but uh, this most recent paper that we saw had them back again towards the range of one and two. So uh, we asked we asked to have a presentation on that and. Uh, uh, 
we're, we're thinking we might might have to commission a paper actually to discuss uh, to, to discuss these. Uh, all right, so I'm almost done. Uh, just a, a very brief preview on the conference. Uh, we'll have two plenaries, the opening one uh, by Otmar on, on, uh, on carbon dioxide pricing, uh, and then uh, Stephanie Stancheva from Harvard University will has a uh, talk on the understanding of trade. That will be the closing session on Friday. Tonight, uh, we have the conference reception and the award ceremony that takes place here, just in the main hallway, I think where you registered, yeah. Um, and then tomorrow we'll have the uh, the dinner cruise. Um, and so I, I think that'll be great. Um, we'd like to apologize that we had to put a cap on this year's uh, attendance. That was for logistical reasons. Uh, I don't think we reached the cap, but maybe, maybe it scared off some potential uh, people, but we have 246 participants, so uh, above average um, for, for for the conference. If you look at the the historical average, lower of course than than when we went. We're all electronic, uh, but we're we're very happy uh, with the level of participation. And uh, I looked at the program; it it looks really great. So I think I, I think you're going to be very very pleased with that. So that that was it for my opening comments. Uh, let me hand the floor to Sergey Paltsev. M many of you know Sergey. Uh, he's, um, um, I'm not going to try and pronounce the title of your agency because it's uh, uh, a mile long, but he's with, uh, with the, the climate group at, uh, at MIT. So, um, Sergey, the floor is yours. Well, thank you, Dominic. Uh, when Dominic first asked me, oh, do you want to chair the opening session? I said, sure, well, it's busy. So all I need to do is make sure that I'm introducing a speaker and then making sure that you behave during Q&A session. And then uh, when I opened uh, the preliminary agenda, I start getting my suspicion because I was allocated five minutes to introduce a speaker. And I started, okay, well, something is going on here. And then when I've learned uh, who is the speaker, uh, well, I know that probably five minutes is not enough to introduce Otmar. And so uh, those of you who are uh, very involved in the economics of climate change, uh, well, Otmar doesn't need any introduction, but those of you who are not as intimately involved uh, in that, uh, I'll spend some time and kind of describe uh, his contributions. Well, first of all, uh, Professor Dr. Otmar Georg Edenhofer, uh, he is a director and he is chief scientist of the Potsdam Institute for Climate Impact Research, known as PIC. He's also a director of Mercator Research Institute on Global Commons and Climate Change. He is also a professor of climate economics and public policy at Technische <laughs> University of Berlin, Technical University of Berlin. Well, I wouldn't go to all of his CV. I downloaded his short CV from his website and it's 10 pages. So you can guess how long is the long CV. Mm -hmm. So he is a member of many, many boards and many, many prestigious awards. And indeed, uh, I think he is one of the most influential figures uh, in terms of the trying to integrate social sciences into the area of climate change. I had my personal pleasure of working with Otmar uh, when I was uh, one of the lead authors of the IPCC uh, assessment, integrated assessment uh, AR5, the previous one, not the latest one, but previous one. So Otmar was uh, one uh, of the co-chairs for the working group three for that assessment report. And again, uh, I was amazed uh, by how he can handle this very, very delicate, very, very complicated enterprise where you're herding well, many cats who are trying to go into different directions. And he was very efficient at managing that process. Uh, at some times when I see what, how much he is doing and what he is publishing and I'm following uh, his, uh, his publications, well, I think that he also didn't put something to his CV. I think somewhere secretly he created either a cloning machine or time machine. Because I'm not sure where he get his 24 hours, uh, because definitely I wouldn't be able to keep up with that if I would 
try uh, even to replicate all that or to read his papers. Uh, I also discovered that uh, he is uh, not only a prominent researcher, but uh, he is a very good educator. So he prepared 52 PhDs already. And uh, if I'm correct, and Otmar can correct me, if the number is correct, his website says that currently he is supervising 23 PhD students. Again, there's somewhere secret time machine or cloning machine. So kind of, I'm, I'm really happy that he's sharing his knowledge uh, as widely as possible. So uh, I think we have a very distinct privilege here. Uh, and again, uh, as Dominic has mentioned, unfortunately, uh, well, the airlines didn't cooperate. And so uh, Otmar uh, wasn't able to fly yesterday evening out of Brussels. So kind of that's why uh, we have a pleasure uh, to have him uh, on Zoom, which means that we are saving some carbon footprint, like we, we, we have some credit for future conferences, right? So already, uh, which is good. Uh, but without further ado uh, to the topic of his presentation. Uh, and again, I'm really looking forward to that because uh, as you see that uh, the topic is not only on the emission reduction or emission mitigation, it's also on negative emissions. It's also on the global waste planetary waste problem and how to deal with that. And again, coming back to the notion of time machine, it's about the future of carbon prices. So really hoping that kind of, uh, we are going to have very good discussion afterwards. So now to the logistics, uh, Otmar will have 30 minutes for his remarks, and then we will have 20 minutes. Well, because we have a Zoom, so kind of we will have the mics here. Whenever you are going to have a question, I would ask you to come closer and I will hand you the mic that kind of everybody can, can see uh, and everybody can uh, hear the questions. Okay, without further ado, uh, ladies and gentlemen, Professor Dr. Otmar Georg Pettenhofer. Thank, thank you very much, Sergio, for these kind words. So I would like to check. So can you hear me and can you see my slides? Perfect. Good. So th thanks a lot, and and I'm very much disappointed that I stranded uh, yesterday evening in Brussels. So now I know how does it feel to be a stranded asset. So uh, fortunately, um, I have now the opportunity to 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 present my thoughts via Zoom, and I have chosen the topic of carbon dioxide removal. Uh, issue and the, the public economics perspective around this issue. Uh, this has two reasons, because this is, of course, an important component of climate policy, but this is something which now is already under discussion uh, in Brussels, uh, in the European Commission, in the European Parliament. And I think this issue requires definitely a lot of input um, from economists and therefore, and from modelers. And therefore, I thought, uh, it might be very appropriate uh, to share uh, my thoughts on 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 this issue uh, on uh, carbon dioxide removals and why I think uh, it is not something which is uh, uh, important in the far distant future. It is important today, and I will explain you why I believe that we are already living uh, in the shadow uh, of of the end game, and and I explain you in a minute what I mean with the end game. So I, I would like to make three steps. First, I will talk about the uh, climate targets and carbon dioxide removal. Uh, then I will uh, introduce so uh, about uh, uh, the, the changes of or the, the, the issue of carbon pricing when carbon dioxide removal technologies become important. And then I will conclude with a few thoughts on governing the CDR uh, in the European Union. Uh, because uh, this is the place where now the governance structure uh, is developed. And, and I hope I can convince you that uh, modeling input and uh, input from economists is, is desperately needed here. Now, let me start uh, saying a few words about uh, climate targets and climate club, uh, uh, CDR technologies. So it's um, it, it goes without saying that it is very unlikely uh, that uh, the 1.5 target and even the two degree limit is is quite realistic. So what we have to do is uh, we have to take into account overshoot. And I think uh, this is a, a very important and a topical issue uh, to understand the uh, the overshoot in in a proper way. 
on the one hand, overshoot has, of course, climate and environmental risks, but it's also economic risks. And I cannot go into the full detail, but just to show you that uh, uh, what you can see here is uh, the, the emission reduction, the pure mitigation, which is required when basically uh, scenarios, only scenarios are taken into account with, with no or limited overshoot, basically requires a very steep emission reduction very soon. Uh, and then we have to end up with uh, zero net negative emissions uh, thereafter, and and this is this is highly unlikely. So, but when we take have to take into account the overshoot scenarios, and of course we can discuss uh, how important and 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 what is the the magnitude of the overshoot, then you can basically see that we might achieve a maximum, but then in the end uh, we can hopefully bend the curve. And, and 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 reduce emissions. And it seems to me that's the only way how we can think about uh, the current uh, climate targets uh, and the climate limits, the temperature limits, uh, when we take into account uh, the uh, the option uh, of CDR technologies. And uh, so that the red line you see basically is an overshoot uh, up to 1.8 degree. Uh, but this allows us much more budget flexibility. But the question is, so to say, do we have the appropriate technologies at hand? And this is why I believe that now we are already entering now in a new phase of climate policy. So we have discussed uh, for a very long time the required mitigation options, and this business is not done yet. We make progress in Europe, in the United States, and other places. So now almost uh, 60 countries are committed to carbon neutrality by 2050. But then uh, we need ne negative emissions in the second half of the century. And uh, so it's not good enough that we basically postpone thinking about CDR into the second half of the century. We have to do it now because we have to upscale technologies. We need the governance structure. And I will explain you uh, that why I believe that in the European Union, this issue will become uh, important very soon for the functioning of the European Emission Trading Scheme. So um, uh, colleagues of mine have published uh, last this year the State of Carbon Dioxide Removal Report. So where they put together um, uh, what we know about the technology, what we know about the costs. And, and the main message here is uh, that uh, the uh, the, the requirements, uh, which are consistent with ambitious climate targets until 2030 and until 2050, are enormous uh, for the different scenarios. You see here basically the different scenarios which focus on renewables, focus on carbon dioxide removals or on demand side reduction. But in all the scenarios, you see basically that we need an enormous amount of carbon dioxide removal technologies. But what's now on the table is 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 not is not sufficient, and and we have a, 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 an enormous gap, and it is uh, necessary to close the gap. Uh, just to give you uh, an indication, so in most of the scenarios we see, basically by 2050, um, uh, 10 gigatons on an annual basis of carbon dioxide removal technologies, and if you put a price tag on this. Uh, this could add up to 3% of world GDP, which has to be invested in this type of technologies. So um, what about the, then the, the portfolio of options? So there, there's a huge discussion. And of course, uh, many engineers try to, 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 to sell one of the silver bullets, but uh, it seems to me it is very important that uh, we carry out a careful modeling analysis in order to come up with a realistic assessment of the of the different uh, portfolios, so this is just one example uh, which which I would like to highlight here, uh, which we did with with the Remind model. So you see basically uh, a few options. The one is Spex, uh, the combination of bioenergy and carbon capture and storage. So this remains for the next ten years an important option. Then direct air capture in the combination with carbon capture and storage uh, might play uh, uh, in the next 20 years a limited role. Nevertheless, I think it is very important that we invest in the upscaling of these technologies, afforestation, reforestation, 
enhanced stroke weathering uh, are also part of the portfolio. And uh, so what, what I would like to convey here is that uh, higher CDR availability uh, can lead to lower levels of net emissions and, and enhance earlier emission neutrality and limit contribution of each option. So, of course, uh, we have to think about this. This is about the costs, but also about environmental constraints. Uh, and uh, we have to deal with the relevant risk and the trade-offs. But the most important is message here is it's, it's not a silver bullet. We have to come up with a reasonable portfolio of these options. And I think this is a, a rapid changing environment and we need a, a good understanding how uh, these different options can be embedded uh, in a reasonable strategy. And also, um, uh, we have to think, and this is something which might be very important for for the GTAP, uh, GTAP community. So the it's it's also it's also about regional development. It's not good enough just to come up with a broad uh, and uh, uh, understanding about the portfolio options because this is very site specific and location specific, and there is uh, a competitive advantage for different regions for different options which has to be taken into account for a reasonable assessment. Now, what I would like to, to, to highlight here is uh, that this is a, a technological challenge. This is something for upscaling, but this is also something on the, on the governance. And here, I just want to hint to two papers, which we have recently uh, uh, published in, in, in the work says E for working uh, paper series. One is a PICU's advice and Sisyphus warning. So this is something which I would like to elaborate a little bit and then on the broader governance issue and, and how we should think about from a public economics perspective. So the most important aspect here, uh, what we have to understand is when we talk about the CDR option is that the storage time of CDR methods vary significantly. And the storage time and the permanence of CDR is very important for um, a, a proper understanding of the economics of, of CDR. Here you see basically um, uh, different technologies, which I mentioned in my previous slide, afforestation, reforestation, BEX, enhanced weathering, biochar, and ducts. And these are, are, are different storage duration times. And, and one thing many environmentalists believe that we should only use permanent CDR options. Uh, but, but I think uh, this is, this is not appropriate. We have to include also the non-permanent uh, CDR options because uh, for the next uh, two or three decades, the non-permanent CDR options might be the one which are available. And then we might think about on ducks and, and, uh, and, and other options which have a uh, higher storage time. But but this is important that uh, it's not only important to think about the costs, it's also important to think about the permanence issue when we talk about uh, the uh, the proper pricing uh, of, of carbon dioxide removal technologies. And here what we did in this paper is that we highlight that um, it is not good enough just to think about the social costs of carbon emissions. So the conventional social costs of carbon emission is a measure of the marginal climate damage from one ton of carbon emitted into the atmosphere. But when we take into account carbon dioxide removals, and in particular, when we take into account non-permanence, we need a new metric. And the new metric is the social costs of carbon uh, removals, and it measures uh, uh, climate damages resulting from releasing emissions from a storage. And the social costs of emissions and the social costs of removals are central concepts for the design uh, of pricing and subsidy policies. So just to, to highlight here what, what, what we derived in, in this paper is a kind of a, a modified hoteling rule. Uh, why a modified hoteling rule? Because uh, we, we do not talk about the, the atmosphere as a reservoir. We take into account also uh, the carbon sinks uh, as, as, as a reservoir in now thinking. In the end, uh, what we have to do is we have to manage different carbon reservoirs. So that's, that's basically uh, the, 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 the main message here. And this is why I, I talked about planetary waste management. I, I, I only talk about how to manage here the different 
and a multitude of uh, carbon reservoirs. And, and here you see basically the, 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 the two uh, hoteling rules, so to say, which is the growth rate of the social uh, costs of emissions and the, co so the growth rate of the social uh, costs of removal. A and in the end, uh, this is nothing more and nothing else as a, an arbitrage condition. And, and, and what this shows is that increasing the discount rate leads to higher deployment of CDR and hence more rapid use of fossil fuels. So this is, should not be a great surprise uh, because this is something uh, which, which we can anticipate uh, from, from common sense economics. Higher damages caused by fossil fuel emissions make abatement of emissions more desirable and lower release rates make carbon removal uh, more attractive. So that's that's here an, an important component. But when it comes now to the, the carbon pricing, uh, we have much more options than we thought because uh, uh, we have to embed carbon pricing in a management, in an industrial management of the whole and the global carbon cycle. I think this is the, 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 the most interesting aspect here uh, that in the end, the new phase of climate policy has a lot to do with uh, carbon cycle management. And, and here I just want to, to highlight um, a few uh, aspects here, how we could deal with carbon pricing. So the, the first and the most important thing is that um, carbon pricing uh, has now, when we take into account carbon dioxide removal, uh, two components. Uh, first, uh, we, we price, so to say, the, the emissions. So this is usual carbon pricing, but with the same price in, an, in a first best scenario, uh, we basically also subsidize uh, carbon removals because we rent, so to say, uh, the the carbon sinks, and somebody has to pay for this. And uh, in the in the first best solution, the carbon price has a positive uh, component, which is imposed by uh, emissions, and has a um, uh, a negative component, which is a subsidy for the removals. And we could start with just a simple downstream pricing. The polluter pays the same carbon price, regardless of whether they constitute initial greenhouse gas emissions from combustion of fossil fuels or release uh, of previously stored carbon from temporary storage. So that's downstream pricing. But also we could think about an upstream pricing. Uh, emissions from burning fossil fuels are priced. The government uh, provides a subsidy to providers or suppliers of carbon sinks, but discounts the subsidy of carbon removal upfront according to the expected release rate. Of course, uh, there is an uh, information requirement issue involved. The stock of carbon has to be monitored and detailed information of each technology has to be available. And of course, when it comes to carbon pricing, this will mobilize a lot of lobby groups uh, to negotiate the release rate. And this is already happening now in Brussels. A lot of people think about this. But it's, uh, you could also then basically just to, to, to price uh, the emissions, but then um, you, uh, uh, you can impose a, or you can provide a storage stock subsidy paid as an annual stock subsidy proportional to the size of the carbon reservoir at the rate of the marginal damage. The stock subsidy does not require to calculate the time part of the social costs of carbon. So firm, firms will only be paid when they can prove that carbon is still stored. So firms uh, will not go bankrupt strategically. So this is the, uh, the, the requirement. And then the, the fourth one is uh, a rental charge for the share of carbon of a firm stores in the atmosphere. And these carbon shares could become tradable and include upfront uh, payments through bonds. Uh, it requires a separate incentive and monitoring for the scheme of carbon sinks. So, but these are the options and part, some of these options are already discussed in the literature and needs more careful thinking. Now, there are reasons why um, people might think that uh, we should depart from uh, the first best price rule, uh, pricing the emissions with the same price than uh, carbon sinks. So one reason is when we take into account um, uh, the interregional inter leakage. And here we did a paper in, in CHIM where we thought about a carbon pricing for carbon dioxide removals under interregional leakage. And under interregional le carbon leakage, the optimal CDR subsidy 
should exceed the price for carbon. Why? Because reducing emissions by a ton of CO2 domestically causes more interregional leakage than removing a ton. So that's that's the, the, the basic rule and, and the common sense. And this wedge may be uh, exacerbated or reversed depending on the resource balance of a country. A net exporter of fossil fuel resources increases the price differential to increase the rents of the carbon resources produced. And a net importer sets a carbon price above the CDR subsidy to appropriate some of the resource rents from the resource exporters. And you might think this is just an, might be an interesting piece for international trade it is, but it is not the only reason. So what we see now is in the preparation of COP28, uh, that in particular, um, countries in the MENA region, Saudi Arabia, United Emirates, and so on, start to think about carefully uh, about subsidy schemes for CDR because uh, uh, resource exporting countries have a strong incentive to promote CDR. And this is the reason why basically in, in a world where we have not a global climate agreement and not a comprehensive carbon pricing scheme, there are reasons to depart from the first best rule. Another reason, which is uh, debated uh, quite uh, heavily uh, in many circles, also definitely here in, in Brussels, is that they want to separate a quantity target for the residual emissions and the CDR. And the reason is obvious why they want to depart from this first best optimum, because they are afraid when uh, CDR is announced that this might lead to mitigation deterrence. And if this is the case, so some people think that CDR, uh, we should uh, formulate an own quantity target for CDR. But indeed, uh, literally, this comes with a price. And here I have highlighted um, a, a, the hoteling price path, as you can see here. And this is the efficient price path. And then basically CDR uh, uh, is functioning here almost as a backstop technology. And when the price for the backstop, backstop technology is achieved, so then the um, that CO2 price uh, uh, is not zero, but it will become constant. But the same is true then with the CDR subsidies. And you can see here, basically, there is, of course, a, a welfare loss uh, when there is a difference between the CO2 price and the CDR subsidy. Uh, so if the CO2 price is higher than the CDR subsidies, so then policymakers might have a fiscal surplus uh, the other way around they might run a fiscal deficit so this is something which will be discussed because uh, the cdr subsidies are then basically coming from from public money so this is this is an, an important aspect here and this is also something which has to be taken into account so uh, in the short run the cdr uh, target might be credible but when the price differential uh, becomes too large so there might be then uh, a strong incentive from the policymaker side, but also from the industry side uh, to converge uh, 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 basically the, the two price levels, which implies then uh, that we would do in the end uh, more CDR and less mitigation. So this is an, an ongoing debate. So this is a, a welfare economic issue, but this is also a political economy issue. So it depends very much uh, what uh, policymakers might have in mind, if they are primarily interested in a in a surplus, so they might go for a higher CO two price uh, and for a lower CDR subsidy. Uh, if they are interested to to relax and uh, to reduce the costs of the industry, so they they might go the other way around, and this could lead then also to all sorts of political economy cycling. Now let me talk a little bit about the, the current debate in the in the European Union about uh, CDR, uh, and and this now should become very clear that uh, CDR is nothing which will happen in the far distant future. This is an, an, a debate now. Now this is um, one of the scenarios uh, uh, you you run with with your own models, but uh, this is just a an iconic uh, graphic for the European Green Deal. So uh, by 2050, uh, Europe wants to become carbon neutral. So this will lead to a huge transformation in the building 
in the industry sector, in, in, in the transport sector. But at the same time, so uh, we start basically now with CDRs. Currently, the CDRs are fundamentally land-based, land use. So increasingly, BECs uh, will enter the stage. Uh, and, and, and then over time, uh, so when, when uh, we have to compensate with CDR, the uh, residual emissions in, in the other sectors. So this, this is uh, what, what, what has to happen. And this brings me now to uh, my, my, my next uh, thing where I started to say in the beginning that now we are all day living um, in the shadow of an end game. Why? Because what you can see here is roughly in 2039, we will sell the last permit uh, in the emission trading uh, uh, system or the emissions trading scheme at the European Union. But still, we will have residual emissions. And the question is, so what happens with the residual emissions? So somebody has to take care of, of these residual emissions. So And uh, the anticipation of what will happen uh, uh, is, is something which investors um, take into account now. So the increasingly scarce allowance supply will heavily alter price formation uh, and the functioning of the market because uh, investors and traders will form expectations what will happen after 2030. So the, the end game is characterized by a transition from positive to negative supply equilibrium. And the commission is very well advised uh, to form stable expectations about this because in the worst case scenario, uh, the emission savings scheme uh, could break down. This raises the question whether the ETS is fit for climate neutrality and how governance must be adjusted to account for the changes. So, and, 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 and this is something which, which, which is now on the table uh, now. And uh, so uh, the, the, the fundamental question is uh, who will take care, who will compensate the residual emissions and do we have then the appropriate CDR options available to compensate this and then to stabilize this in a way uh, which helps uh, to form in a reasonable way the, the price formation in the ETS market. So in the short run, we will basically have uh, uh, in particular non-permanent removals available. It's, it's very unlikely that we can just rely on the permanent. At least we should take into account the non-permanent uh, removals. But the non-permanent removals have to be compensated either by further removals, which could be permanent or non-permanent. And this is uh, what we have in mind when we talked about Pigou's advice and Sisyphus warning, because if we deal with the non-permanent, we can, of course, uh, substitute the non-permanent removals with other non-permanent removals. But then, so the commission uh, has to take on uh, Sisyphus' task for an, an, uh, an ongoing renewal of this permanent. And so the initial removal, what you see of non-permanent units creates an additional ETS certificate. Released emissions from reservoir have to be compensated by an additional removal. And this goes on uh, uh, until infinity or at least until permanent removals uh, um, are available. So this is something which seems to me is, is quite important because many people believe uh, that uh, in the class of the non-permanent removals, the land-based removals are incredibly cheap. Now, what I would like to show with that here is this is in fact not the case. Land-based uh, solutions can be very expensive. Why? So let me, let me uh, ex uh, guide you through this table a bit. So the, the carbon debt from non-permanent removal activities um, uh, has to be taken into account. And when basically a firm stores one ton CO2 for 10 years, let's say for 20 euros per ton, it needs to set aside an additional amount of M multiplied 20 to ensure a perpetual removal. Now let's assume a discount rate of 2% and the marginal removal cost, which might be have is, is constant. So then a land manager has to set aside a financial amount of five times the initial removal cost. So this is a significant multiplier. But let's assume that the discount rate remains 2% 
and the marginal removal costs do grow over time, let's say with the same rate, then you see immediately that a land manager has to set aside a financial amount, which is infinite times the initial removal costs. And uh, this clearly shows that uh, this non-permanent removals could become uh, very costly. Now you might say, what do we know about the marginal removal costs? Now we know from the marginal removal costs, uh, when it, they are land-based, that the growth rate of agricultural land is in the order of magnitude of the interest rate now. So here we are at risk that we basically create uh, almost a carbon debt, which private markets cannot bear. And this is the reason why uh, we made a proposal here that we need a kind of a, a new institutional structure. An institutional structure in particular, where uh, an institution serves as a, a lender of last resort uh, to make sure that the non-permanent removal activities is, is, is properly managed. And in the end, non-permanent removals might be replaced by removal activities. And we have assigned uh, this idea to a European carbon central bank. And you might say, okay, this is one of the many crazy ideas academics might have in an afternoon. But um, we convinced a few officials from the commission uh, to write together a paper. This is paper I mentioned uh, in the worker paper series at the beginning of my talk, where we spelled out to say how such a European uh, carbon central bank could be designed and could be involved in this management of CDR options. Then this is something which is already underway, a carbon removal certification authority. So because we need a certification of these technologies about the, the non-permanence and all these issues. And then of course, uh, when we have it, we, we might think that at the beginning, it could be a good idea to set uh, an own CDR goal, but then a reverse auction could be implemented uh, to finance uh, at least the upscaling of these new technologies. And this Green Leap Innovation Authority is discussed by, 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 by many people um, in order to, to, to incentivize the necessary uh, uh, innovations. But the European Carbon Central Bank so is, is, is something which has also the task uh, uh, to, to manage the transition uh, from, um, from a, a net zero uh, to to a net negative um, uh, uh, um, economy. Now I'm I'm very close to the end of my of my presentation, and and I would like to to summarize uh, the messages which I would like to convey and discuss with you. So climate targets cannot be met without CDR, irrespective uh, of the upscaling of uh, nuclear uh, renewables and and other technologies. Sustainable managing the carbon cycle is a core challenge of climate action in the 21st century. And carbon neutrality, from my point of view, is, is here the entry point. And carbon neutrality uh, is, is, is the turning point to think in a new way about climate policy as the management of the carbon cycle. And I call this the planetary waste management. Why? Because uh, many people had in mind that CDR could, be, could lead to mitigation deterrence. But uh, from my point of view, it highlights a second principle. So the first principle is the polluter should pay so for, for emissions. But here, uh, when we talk about the CDR, it is an option basically to, to compensate the overshoot. And uh, this is something which basically means that uh, you, you, you take care of the waste you have released. So the CDR gap needs to be addressed swiftly. Uh, early years of technology deployment are decisive for upscaling and successfully meeting demand in the coming decades. And therefore, uh, reverse auctions in the very beginning seems to me very important that we see and uh, basically this, uh, this upscaling of these technologies. So third, without good governance, the CDR gap won't close and mitigation efforts might be jeopardized. Deployment at scale requires a consistent policy framework and solid incentive schemes. Of course, this takes time and therefore we should uh, kick off this debate. A governance framework of carbon dioxide removal and a mandate for a European carbon central bank could and should find its way into EU legislation. Of course, we are far away from that, but at least uh, the Commission and people in the Commission are willing uh, to discuss this issue 
in, 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 in some detail. So thanks a lot, and I look forward to our discussion. Well, thank you, Otmar. Uh, it was a great presentation, very policy relevant, and uh, it's uh, very informative. Okay, now I'm going to have a challenge how to manage the mics, right? Because those who are in the middle will be a little bit disadvantaged. Uh, so if you can help me, and if you have a question, well, first of all, raise your hand, or if you can come down here, that will be even uh, more useful. Uh, don't uh, forget to state your name and uh, kind of the organizational institution which you are representing. So, uh, well, let's start with questions. Okay, okay, well, Dominic. Yeah, Atmar, thanks a lot. That was a, a wonderful presentation. Um, so I haven't been too involved in this literature. I was thinking, if the Europeans deal with this on their own, kind of what are, what are the interactions with the rest of the world? Uh, I mean, are, I mean if I'm thinking about, would there be offset? Would Europeans be allowed to buy CDR out, outside of Europe? Uh, like like pay, pay the Middle Eastern exporters to keep the oil on the ground or something? Uh, Dominic, it's, uh, I'm not sure acoustically, I, I, I didn't get the, the question. So you basically, it seems that you ask about the voluntary offset market. Was that right? Well, I, mean, I just kind of wondered if the EU goes alone, what would be, you know, potential spillover effects on non-EU countries? Yeah, yeah. Uh, that, that's a, that's a great question. I, 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 I didn't highlight the, the impact um, of the voluntary <laughs> offset markets on, on the CDR deployment. And I think this, this is an aspect which definitely needs uh, further thoughts because at the voluntary offset market, a lot of things are going on. Uh, so most people have in mind voluntary offset market means to pay a little bit for afforestation. But now people start to think uh, to finance at the voluntary offset market, even, even direct air capture. And, and, and I think uh, it 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 could be very interesting. Aramco uh, in Saudi Arabia announced they will come up with a DAX uh, facility, uh, which allows to, uh, to 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 offset or to to remove carbon uh, with around 150 euros per ton CO2. So let's assume that this will happen. So this would have an immediate impact on the compliance market. When the residual emissions can only be reduced, let's say around two to three hundred euros per ton CO2, and you can have on the voluntary offset market a, a one hundred fifty. Uh, so then, then basically, uh, this is something which, which, which basically people will uh, will put a lot of pressure to include then ducks in the uh, in in the compliance market. So this is an, an interesting interplay. On the other hand, I would say when the European Union now starts to certify uh, the CDR options, so then this might also uh, serve as a gold standard uh, for the voluntary offset markets. Thank you. Other questions? Oh, please. Uh, otherwise, I'll go back to Dominic for the next half an hour. So, <laughs> yeah, please. And uh, I think closer, uh, keep it closer to Mike. I think hopefully that will. And please introduce yourself. Thanks. I'm Mary Burfisher with the GTAP Center, and I was wondering if you could comment on the state of technology for the carbon dioxide removal and uh, whether or how you incorporate possible innovation in your, um, in your strategies. Yeah, thanks. Thank you very much. So what I just said is that um, in the strategy or in the, in the modeling activity, uh, let me start first with the strategy. I think the best way would be now uh, that uh, so the European Union could start with a with a CDR goal in the beginning, and then organize reverse auctions where basically 
the uh, new technologies will be will be just auctioned and and subsidized. I think that that seems to me would be very very important. Of course, this is also important for for modeling activities in particular when it comes to uh, the uh, bioenergy and carbon capture and storage. So that that's important. Here you need also a quite comp have to take into account the emissions from from land use. Otherwise, you have a lot of general equilibrium effects, uh, which might be create very perverse incentives. But 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 first of all, I would say start with with subsidizing pilot projects. Start subsidizing uh, new technologies at the full range. Uh, I think uh, direct air capture is, from my point of view, very promising, and uh, it would be good if the European Union would finance a few of of, of these pilot projects. And secondly, uh, start to 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 then when they basically are, uh, uh, so to say, a little bit more mature, reverse auctions could be the next step. And uh, yeah, and I think so. In in the end, when it comes to backs, so then uh, the, the the pricing of 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 land use emissions will become also a very important thing. And by the way, at the European level, we are now starting. Uh, to implement a third emission trading scheme in the agricultural sector. This is also a fascinating aspect here. We have uh, an ETS-1 for power and um, uh, industry, a second one now for transport and building, and the third one should be implemented or will be implemented for the agricultural sector. Uh, so this, this is showing now that, that the pricing, the carbon pricing thing is, is, is now at the core still in the core of the European Green Deal, but we have not a reliable subsidy scheme uh, to finance this, uh, these innovations. That is. Well, it's very lively. Uh, Matthias Weinzel from the Joint Research Center of the European Commission. Uh, thank you for your very interesting talk, very uh, well stimulating. And you briefly mentioned the fiscal surplus or deficit that may arise from the change occurring from selling emission permits to basically needing to pay the finance um, removals. And uh, the current ETS, uh, we're moving more towards auctioning. And uh, I think the public acceptance hinges a bit on the fact that uh, we make polluters pay, this is accepted. We finance green technologies or help. Uh, uh, households that may not struggle that may be struggling with the transition and these are more potentially accepted uh, uh, uses of this money in the models of course changing from a surplus of uh, permits to a deficit is just a sign of a uh, change of size and in the models it works quite well but do you think this also works in the public or would you have a challenge if we move to uh, large-scale removals that would need to be financed and thus run a long-term uh, financial deficit thank you do you hear the question, Otmar? Yeah, yeah, uh, very okay. clearly. Thanks, thanks. Yeah, thank, thank you for the questions. Um, I, I think uh, this this uh, this raises an an, an 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 additional layer of complexity when it comes to to public acceptance that people have to learn that uh, in the end we have to pay for the carbon sinks. It's a, a rental charge, so to say when we rent the carbon sink. So and and this is a, a, a lot of money. It, it's it's roughly for the European Union we calculated at the back on the envelope calculation one percent of European GDP. So that, that's that's a lot. And and if you look at the, the global numbers which come out of the IPCC scenarios, so it's even three percent. And and this this money has to come from 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 the um, from public finance. So in that sense, I anticipate here definitely a, a an additional layer. But on the other hand, it is welfare improving because otherwise, so we can basically bend the curve, we can manage uh, the the overshoot. Uh, all these things are not easy to communicate in, in 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 the public. But I think we have we have to do this because this is a pure implication of this goal net carbon neutrality, and and when policymakers think they are or when policymakers expect that we should take this seriously. So then the implication is then we have to pay for the carbon removals. But anyway, it's now time 
uh, for the politicians to explain the public. Uh, uh, so um, climate policy has its costs. It has its benefits, but it has definitely has its costs. Thanks, thanks for the excellent presentation. So the question that I have is that we already have very close. I cannot understand it. Can you can you now? The what, the, what about this? Can we try a second mic? Antoine, maybe pass pass that. And then we'll come back to it. Okay. Okay. Can you hear now? Yeah. Yeah, wonderful. Thanks. Good, good. It seems something was wrong with that microphone. So this is Farzad Tawaripur from Purdue University uh, GTAP Center. So thanks for the excellent presentation. So the question that I have is that we already know that um, any um, carbon removal land-based um, policies will have major implications for the food prices. So in addition to the cost that you mentioned, uh, uh, we need to take into account that kind of cost as well. So would you please elaborate on that? Thank you. Yeah, thanks. So this, this is another important issue, which, uh, which, which I had not presented here, but uh, of course, when it comes, this is in particular the food prices in particular issue when, when basically bioenergy plus carbon capture and storage is used to the BEX, the BEX option. And of course, also the, the afforestation and yeah, in particular the afforestation option, it, it has an, an an impact definitely on 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 the food prices, but also the increase of the food prices could also be um, compensated by via uh, an increase of let's say all sorts of of productivity. But I think uh, this is definitely one of the environmental risks, and this is the reason why I think it wouldn't be wise. Uh, to to rely extensively on 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 CDR in general and within this CDR portfolio uh, primarily on 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 Bex and most of the scenarios uh, carried out for the IPCC so Bex in the models dominates as as one of the CDR options and I think it is worthwhile for the modeling community uh, to think carefully how to include. Um, other options, and also uh, to think about uh, uh, price-induced productivity increases in the agricultural sector. I, I think that's that, that seems to me is important. And the second aspect, which is is already in the model, but uh, so uh, so to, to to think what are the impacts of BEX and the CDR options when we do not have um, a comprehensive pricing scheme. Uh, between the energy sector pricing the fossil fuels and emissions uh, induced uh, by by the land use system, I think that that's quite important, so that we get a better understanding of the order of magnitude of potential perverse effects. And one study which will be published soon in Nature Climate Change from the Potsdam Institute, we show that basically it's not so important how large the price differential is between pricing land use based emissions and 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 um, uh, fossil fuel emissions it is much more important uh, that, that the, the pricing scheme is relatively comprehensive and this is on, on the one hand good news because uh, we could live with with relative modest price levels but there are also bad news because it is very hard uh, to implement a comprehensive pricing scheme in the land use sector thank you we have another question in the middle uh, Otmar Alan Matthews, uh, University of Dublin. Uh, really sorry you're not able to be with us uh, this morning. Uh, a question on EU uh, governance. Um, we have uh, uh, an increasing tendency for individual member states uh, to adopt uh, net zero uh, commitments, some of them in legislation. Um, and I'm just curious uh, as to your view from a trade economist point of view, it's almost like saying that every country should be self-sufficient in food, uh, that every country should actually reach net zero itself. And I'm just curious how you see that working out uh, in the EU as we uh, move forward to 2040, for example. Yeah, th th thank you very much. Great question. 
uh, first of all, um, it, it goes without saying that it doesn't make sense uh, that uh, we should now come up with self-sufficiency, right? So that's that's not the right thing to do. Um, I think uh, so that the best way would be, would be, from my point of view, to include this in a proper way in, in an emissions trading scheme and, and as a EU as such, we should do this. So I think it doesn't make sense that every country and uh, every company and every municipality formulates not net zero goals. So that's so that's that's not it, it's it. So it could you, you could start with that, but then it should be clear that trading mechanisms should be allowed. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks very much. Is that, is that on? Yeah. Yeah, yeah no, it's Thanks great. very much for the talk. It was great. And Tom Rutherford, University of Wisconsin. Ah, Tom, hi. Hi. I'm, I'm kind of curious. I've, I've wondered at different points about the, the, we have a historical analog for direct air capture and so forth, which is the introduction of sewage treatment systems in urban areas. This was a large major investment that was made to improve public health. Is there, is that, how should we think about it that way? Is this is this something that 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 ultimately, or do you believe that ultimately we can't depart from the carbon tax? It's at some point this this is not going to be a uh, a problem that can be be solved entirely by carbon capture. And these technologies are something that will make it so that we can turn the page and not worry about this in the future. But but uh, Tom, I'm not sure what is, is your question. So to say. How can we depart from a positive to a negative carbon pricing scheme, or do, is is your is your question more referred to the the time which is required for the upscaling of this? I guess the upscaling. It's more about if the cost of these carbon direct air capture systems meet yeah. the, what's the optimistic objectives. Will this will will climate become a problem that is analogous to? Yeah, uh, waste treatment in large urban areas. Yeah, That's yeah, important. yeah. Thanks. So what what we what we did is so uh, uh, we 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 also worked with a historical analog on technological development and and we basically uh, uh, started to with, with with a very simple thing which is uh, the scaling up of of PV and 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 the interesting thing is that. I would say PV is something where we saw uh, a rapid upscaling, so which was unanticipated, uh, and nobody thought about this. Uh, just to, to give you a, um, an, an anecdote here, when I published as a co-chair of IPCC the special report on renewables, um, I allowed uh, that one scenario has been as assessed, which was perceived at this time as a radical green scenario. And even that radical green scenario was far below uh, the, the 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 actual deployment. But the interesting thing is, if you look at the numbers which basically the European Union has 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 announced for hydrogen and also for the CDR technologies, so the the speed of upscaling is even above uh, the, the the deployment of PV. So this is another way to say that I don't think that this is very credible. And, and we have for ducks, for example, to my knowledge, uh, one pilot project in Iceland. And, and I think we, we would need five of them and, and, and to do this. So, uh, um, Aramco might now implement uh, a new one. And, and I think um, uh, without, with, without financing these pilot projects, we, we, we won't see any 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 reasonable upscaling and and the the speed of upscaling uh, which are now discussed is this is just on paper it's just announced targets but but it's it's far above uh, what we have experienced even in 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 such uh, very rapid uh, deployments like 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 in pv so and and in that sense i would say it's worrying because for most for most policymakers cdr is something which which is relevant in the far distant future, and for them, two thousand fifty is in the far distant future. Thank you. Another question. 
Uh, hi, thank you so much. Uh, it's a great presentation. Um, I'm Justin Johnson from the University of Minnesota. And I was wondering if you could comment on or had any thoughts on um, how the findings of your research here um, on CDR might interact when you think about other environmental goals. And so in particular, I'm thinking about, um, well, I noticed of course that afforestation uh, has a relatively small role in some of the optimal allocations that, uh, that the research you discussed finds. Um, I was wondering if there is any interesting interactions with markets that would be for biodiversity or other aspects of of, uh, environmental protection alongside climate change. It strikes me there might be some interesting interactions uh, in both directions, positive and negative, uh, between these two uh, complementary but sometimes competing goals. Yeah, th thanks a lot. I think this, uh, a lot of research here is, is needed because the link to biodiversity is is, is obvious. And, 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 and that's, that's quite interesting. So, in the European Union, you know that we, we, we have really a very messy uh, agricultural policy. And um, now um, uh, people, in particular farmers, uh, start to think about uh, how to change the subsidy scheme. And CDR could play an important role because farmers might then also provide carbon sinks and, and, and they ask then for compensation. But this is not just for farmers, uh, 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 which which are here uh, an, an important player. Another important player is the chemical industry, and the chemical industry is very unhappy about uh, a, a, a strong reliance or see farmers as suppliers and providers of of carbon sinks, because then they cannot uh, sell any more their fertilizers. So they are basically lobbying now in the European Union. Um, at, at least that 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 this that there will be no fundamental change here, but but that's that's quite interesting. So the 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 link to agricultural policy, but obviously also to to biodiversity. And I think it is an interest. It would be an interesting research agenda to figure out where are really the trade offs between biodiversity and CDR, but we are basically there could be also strong synergies between CDR and biodiversity, and we could use think about how to use um, financing the CDR also as a tool uh, to finance at the same time uh, biodiversity. So I, I think that's that's definitely worthwhile. And the same is uh, the same is true with the with the agricultural policy. Uh, so it's I, I have no deeper insights, but I share with you um, the, the perspective that, that this is a, a, a very important and a very topical research agenda. Thank you. Christoph? Yeah, so Christoph Böhringer, University of Oldenburg. Hi. Hi. Um, so one thing I was wondering about, the battle plan was pretty deterministic, uh, but with this, uh, with this uh, new dimension of removal, we have lots of uncertainty. So something which was missing to my point is the role of uncertainty and uh, hedging strategies. So, is there something fundamentally changing if we take into account the uh, CDR as a new policy option with respect to hedging and <clears throat> risk management? Yeah, first of th th thanks a lot. Unfortunately, I cannot see you, but it's nice to hear you. Um, uh, I, I think um, I, I agree with you. So there, there are two, two dimensions here. It's uncertainty and it's information asymmetry. Uh, and and um, I don't want to come across as, as as overly deterministic because when I talked about the different carbon pricing schemes, so the, the information requirement and the information asymmetries are important. Now, when it comes to uncertainty and the hedging strategy, what I would say, what I'd like to say is, is the following. The last thing which I mentioned is when it, when it comes to the management of the non-permanent removals, I think... Uh, when, when, when basically um, you, 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 you have a risk here that when, when the, 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 the land prices are increasing and the land-based CDR options have the same growth at like the interest rate, the whole thing, the carbon debt, so to say, could become infinitive. And I don't think the market alone can manage then the hedging strategies and can deal with that risk. And therefore, I think we need a, a land of last resort. And if there's a land of last resort, uh, which, which basically takes care of this uh, non-permanent removals, 
So then I think the, that the markets could do this. But but without that, uh, I, I think this is a huge risk that uh, with this policy options, we, we risk all sorts of, um, of, of, of perverse incentives. But I agree with you, uh, taking into account the uncertainty and the hedging strategy explicitly is, is important. But when it comes to these different pricing schemes and also the governance schemes, we are working on this. And, and but I think that's that's an important aspect here. Thank you. Another question. Hello, um, my name is Nihal Yilmaz. I'm with the WTO, and I also had a similar question about the soil-based um, CDR. Whether in the models there is a specific interaction between the um, soil-based sequestration and the crop productivity. So when the soil uh, is used for carbon storage. What happens to the um, to the productivity of the soil if it's used for agriculture? Thank you. Yeah, th th thanks a lot. I, I cannot answer this question because uh, uh, this uh, this I, I even do not know if uh, if if this is explicitly modeled uh, in in, uh, in in the in the agricultural models. So an interesting question, but I have no good answer to that. Okay, other questions. So, so. Hello, I'm Florian Schiffman, Victoria University, Melbourne. Um, well, I've got a question, the capturing part of something like DAX, I can understand, but is there any ongoing cost involved in the carbon storage part of it? Because I think yeah, there are various solutions how to store the captured carbon. Is there any yeah, running cost for the storage or is it assumed that uh, well once it's underground or wherever you store it there is no further cost involved in all the models yeah so there, there are there are uh the so when it is stored so then basically you have monitoring costs to have also the the, the risk of of leakage and when it comes to the basically to 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 the stock prices, where you basically subsidize the, uh, the 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 carbon stock to say, then you have to uh, you have to monitor to what extent the, the the carbon is then really stored. So when when you basically store CO two in a cell in aquifer, so there are no uh, so there are monitoring costs, but 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 not further costs. So in uh, in in Germany, uh, very close to Potsdam. We, we had a pilot project uh, where we basically did an, 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 an ongoing monitoring of, of the, the sequestered, uh, uh, the stored, the, yeah, the sequor, uh, stored and sequestered carbon. Uh, it, it works very well. And I think in the geological formations, the, the leakage rate should be, should be very, very low, uh, I think. And, and also we have, um, dependent on, on the, on the region, um, plenty of, of, of carbon storage uh, facilities, but definitely uh, uh, monitoring is, is required. Any more questions? Yep, please. So we will have this question and that gentleman, and then we are done in terms of time. No, no, go ahead. Yeah, you, you. Hello? Closer to the mic. Yeah. Uh, hello, my name is. Can you hear me? Closer. Yeah. And uh, speak up. Loud. Okay. <laughs> you can hear me now. Uh, my name is Hand Hajar. I'm a PhD student from the High School of Statistics in Algeria. Uh, excuse me. I, I may struggle a little bit with English, so excuse me. Uh, I have a question. Uh, how can we convince uh, uh, developing country? I'm asking this because in the beginning of your presentation, you say that we have to think about uh, negative emission from now uh, better than the, 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 the latest uh, half of the, the, the century. And uh, uh, personally, we have we have problem to convince um, de developing developing country like Algeria. Because uh, they don't, they don't feel, uh, they don't feel that they are uh, responsible of, uh, of climate damage. So, this is my question: How can we do do this? What would be be the uh, a convenient argument? 
Yeah, that, 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 that's a great question. So this is basically how you can convince developing countries to do something. So what, what I can say is that, interesting enough, now there are meanwhile 60 countries uh, which basically uh, uh, announced a carbon neutrality target. So we can think about the, the credibility of these targets. Um, uh, due to to the to to the CBAM, so which basically is a, a, a kind of a, a carbon tariff. Now India starts to implement a, a nationwide emission trading scheme for the for the power sector. So there there are things going on where basically developing countries also uh, participate in, in in that. And in particular, I would say uh, resource exporting countries could have a strong interest in in promoting CDR because. Uh, this is something which helped them so to 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 secure their their resource rents. So in in that sense, I what what I understand now is that in the next COP, in particular the MENA region is is very interested in this, and and I think um, um, the the current president of COP twenty eight uh, he he is now pushing CCS, but but I think he will also push. Uh, during the COP uh, CDR, and and I think uh, some countries might jump on on that bandwagon. So because because it, it helps them to, uh, uh, to 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 participate in 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 in, in climate policy, and and also to 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 counteract to a certain extent the um, the reduction of resource rents which they might anticipate in the future. Thank you. And you have a privilege of the last question of the session. Yeah, perhaps we are talking about... Please, please introduce yourself before. Uh, welcome, Prince University Bonn. We were talking about uncertainty, basically, mostly not from a price perspective, but I think sequestration rates for those land-based options, they are also highly uncertain, but you can reduce uncertainty with certain monitoring measures. So that is a question of transaction costs. Do you think that we need to take this into account when we analyze these different options, or is this basically not important? I think that's that's very important. I think information asymmetries. Uh, so, what are the information requirements for the different tools, and what kind of transaction costs are involved are extremely important. So, this is something which 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 should be done, but uh, for the sake of brevity and also. Uh, Due to the ongoing research, I I, I thought I, I presented first first all the principles, but but this has to be taken into account definitely. I don't want to create the impression that information asymmetries and uncertainty and transaction costs are unimportant. Uh, in contrary, so they are very important, and this is our next step. Well, great. I think we are to a great start of the conference. Uh, please join me in thanking Otmar. Uh, if... well, Otmar, thank you very much. Hopefully next time you'll be here in person uh, yeah, and uh, we will see you. And well, now we have a break and please continue with the conference. <laughs>